are up and and running and uh, live. Uh, great to uh, to be with with you, man. Thank you so much for um, taking time out of your busy schedules to to share a little bit with me. I have looked forward to this and very excited for the possibilities that this will bring. And um, and I and I, I'm just anxious to get to our our conversation here. I am. Um, I want to say on the outset of this that uh, the, the reason for our dialogue today is uh, in light of the recent events that have been going on and the fact that uh, this has uh, brought to the surface a reality that has been a reality uh, for a long, long time. We're not addressing a new reality, but we are addressing a reality. And, uh, and I will just say from the outset that um, I have a a burden, a sense of confession that uh, I have shared with the three of you individually, but I'll do so here in this format to say, uh, I have been asleep too long and I am deeply convicted by my silence and by my inattentiveness to this for so long. I, I uh, have a white preacher friend who has started using the hashtag woke up late and I thought that really, that really um, resonates with me. I, I have woken up late. Um, I, I wish that this conversation would have been had many, many years ago, um, but this is the time that we're having it. And so uh, I, am, I am grateful for your, uh, your willingness to, to be a part of this and to, um, to help share uh, a little bit with me. Uh, we're gonna introduce the, the, the men here on the panel. I'll, I'll go first and just uh, let everybody know who I am. My name is Jeff Darby and I am the preaching minister at the Marysville Church of Christ, Marysville, Ohio. I've been here about uh, six years and uh, I love, uh, love my little country, uh, country surroundings. Uh, wonderful people and a great place to raise a family. I have a 25-year-old uh, son who's married, and he is the associate minister at my church with me. I have a 24-year-old daughter who got married in my backyard quarantine style two weeks ago, and uh, she is uh, newly married, and she's a school teacher in Dublin. I have uh, three little boys. They are six, seven, and ten. They are Royal, Daniel, and Norman. And uh, we adopted them about three years ago. And uh, they are a, a real, one of the real reasons that I have woken up at all. I have woken up late, but thanks to them, I have woken up to the realities of some of the realities of what we have going on in our world due to the fact that uh, they are uh, boys of color. And that has uh, brought an entirely new perspective to my world and one that um, has brought with it a whole new series of questions and uh, led to the reason we're here today, among other things. So let me, uh, let me pass it off. Directly below me as I see it is um, Robert Solomon. Would you introduce yourself? Sir? Okay. Uh, and, and you know, the screens are different for all of us, so. <laughs> I but, know. Uh, uh, but I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Robert Solomon, um, and I, I was born and raised in Akron, Ohio, um, for, for all of my life. Um, I'm a product of Christian education. Uh, I first went to Northeastern Christian University, or Christian College, and graduated from Lipscomb University, uh, and then went on to law school at the Ohio State University Morris College of Law. Uh, and the reason why I mention um, Northeastern cause and Lipscomb is because growing up in Akron, you know, I, I obeyed the gospel um, and was a member of a predominantly uh, black congregation growing up. Uh, we would have singing fellowships with uh, the local white Church of Christ congregations periodically, but that was about the extent of it. I went to Northeastern, which was predominantly white, but had a pretty good critical mass of students. And there I began to develop relationships with my um, uh, white brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and that's when the spark first went off for me. And I had to ask myself, why don't I have those kinds of relationships in the city where I grew up and was a member of the church and there were other congregations in the city? And, and I'll get back to that um, later. In terms of what I uh, do uh, professionally, uh, I am one of the elders of the Genesee Avenue Church of Christ here in Columbus. Uh, I've been a member of this congregation for over 30 years. Um, I've been uh, the youth minister, marriage and family minister, et cetera. 
Uh, and now I serve as an associate minister. You'll meet our senior minister shortly. Um, and that's what I do in my spiritual life, um, in my secular life, if you will. Uh, I'm currently the vice president for inclusion, diversity, and equal opportunity at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And I had a similar post at, at Ohio State University for more than 20 years or so. Uh, and so that kind of gives you a, a professional context and what I think about a lot. And I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction. And we're very glad to have you with us today. Moving around my screen, I come to Dion. Hey. My name is uh, Dion Frazier. Uh, currently, I am the uh, preaching minister at the Reynoldsburg Church of Christ, Reynoldsburg, Ohio. Uh, July, I think, yep, month of July, I'll be celebrating my 18th year uh, at, at Reynoldsburg. Uh, came in 2002. Uh, prior to that, I served at a church in Lansing, Michigan. I was a youth and worship minister in, at Holmes Road Church in Lansing. And prior to that, I was a youth, and, uh, youth minister at West Carpenter Road Church in Flint, Michigan. Um, and, and I would note that both the church in Flint and the church in Lansing were both uh, biracial churches. Uh, in fact, Flint was probably 50-50 black white. The church in Lansing was 40 black, 40 white, 20% Hispanic. Um, and interestingly enough, now in Reynoldsburg, I would say <laughs> Reynoldsburg is probably 90 to 95% white uh, and 5% minority. I grew up in Buffalo, New York at a predominantly black church. Um, <clears throat> I, and, and you know, for maybe sake of this conversation, I grew up in a church um, that built into who we were was a distrust for white churches. Um, and a lot of that stems from um, a long history of uh, preachers back in the 40s and 50s that were told by white churches, you know, go, go, go do your own thing in the inner city. Um, and, and so there was, again, just sort of this built in, um, just distrust of white churches. Uh, I went to college at Rochester University, so a similar experience to you, Robert, uh, pr predominantly uh, white school. Uh, it was probably my first, um, you know, sort of major interaction with uh, other Church of Christ Christians uh, that, that were white. Uh, but, and I can talk about this probably in, in, in some upcoming conversations, I've, I've always had a heart for racial reconciliation and multicultural context. Uh, that's, that's been my heart, my passion, will remain my heart, my passion. Um, so that, that's me. I'm married, been married 20 years to a, to a white woman. And we have uh, two beautiful kids, uh, Caitlin and, and Kira, which brings, you know, a, a another level of conversation in terms of how we're dealing with these, these most recent conversations. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a good perspective. And for the record, uh, I think your bills are in for a good season. So <laughs> I have, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sporting my bills hard today. I haven't got a bills watch on. So yeah, you are, you are, you're sporting it. <laughs> we probably have some words that we can talk about from the, from the looks of uh, Vincent's screen down there. I could see that he's anything but a bills fan. Uh, yeah. 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 Why don't you, uh, why don't you go next and, and tell us about yourself, brother Ford. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so, um, of course, my name is Vince Ford. I'm the senior minister at the Church of Christ of Genesee Avenue. I um, work alongside Brother Solomon and a whole host of other uh, leaders and teachers and, you know, fellow parishioners. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you, you all know, uh, but those who may watch this may not know, but uh, Genesee Avenue is a predominantly black uh, congregation. Um, I would be, I would go out on a limb and say we might be 99.6% uh, black. Um, and uh, we are right in the heart of a very, of what you would call the hood. Um, you know, we're at the edge of the Northeast, um, right there in the Linden community. Um, you know, a lot of black owned businesses, a lot of minority owned businesses, um, a number of uh, payday loan and, and liquor store locations um, in our neighborhood, but a lot of great people. Um, in our neighborhood. Uh, just some background on me. Um, I, I grew up 
the Church of Christ is all I know. Um, my great grandmother, you know, who died in 2017, at 101 years old, uh, she was one of the original uh, members of the Ninth Street Church, um, and uh, spent a lot of time at the Dallas West Church of Christ, uh, where Sammy Berry um, is the minister. And, and if you follow anything as it pertains to uh, uh, police brutality, anything like that, then you probably heard of the name Botham uh, Jean, um, who was killed in his own apartment. Um, Botham was the music minister at the church of which my grandmother has been a member for over 50 years. Um, and so uh, I've, I've preached there a number of times. And my wedding was actually at that congregation. Uh, my parents got married at that congregation. Um, and Brother Sammy Berry, who is a Harding alum, um, has been at the forefront um, of, of social justice and inequality as it pertains to speaking out, um, especially amongst the, the Churches of Christ. Um, I grew up at Greenville Avenue Church of Christ, uh, which is a predominantly black congregation, a very large congregation in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but I also attended Southwestern Christian College, um, which is a Church of Christ affiliated school, uh, but is also a historically black college. Um, so I, my, my high school and middle school experiences, um, you know, for school obviously uh, was uh, predominantly uh, white schools, uh, but I did go to a black college. And then I went to Stephen F. Austin State University, which was a predominantly white institution. Nonetheless, I was vice president of the NAACP chapter while I was there. Um, um, and uh, I, my, my background beside preaching is education. Uh, so I was a public school teacher for about six years. I taught middle school um, in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, and uh, attended Grand Canyon University for a lot of my graduate work. Um, I, I also interned at Saturn Road Church of Christ. Um, and so I, I got a, a lot of time there, a very large congregation, large predominantly white congregation. Um, and uh, right now, uh, obviously in conjunction with serving as a senior minister, um, also we have a family resource center at Genesee Avenue Foundations for Families in which, you know, we work uh, with domestic violence victims. Uh, we provide food for individuals. Um, and so we see a lot of oppressed um, and uh, impoverished people um, on a daily basis. Um, and so, um, and obviously, many of you probably know that our church is also affiliated with a direct action and research training organization called BREAD, uh, which does a lot of social justice things in the community as well. Um, so it revolves, revolves around me. An interesting thing though, especially as it pertains to the relationship that we see with police officers. Uh, my father served as a police officer for over 30 years. Um, and uh, my mother um, is also a captain in the U.S. Army. Um, so uh, my perspective um, comes from a number of different places. Uh, nonetheless, you know, our parents were very, 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 very um, uh, intentional uh, about making sure that we knew our history growing up. Uh, so uh, that's me. I've been married. Uh, it'll be nine years in August. I have three beautiful black sons um, that are, are extremely knowledgeable of what's going on, especially my 11 year old. Uh, and so uh, just to kind of give you a perspective of, you know, where I stand um, as a, a member of the Lord's church, um, as well as an activist in the community. I, uh, I know this is a, a, an outstanding panel that, uh, that has been assembled here for this purpose. And uh, to each one of you, again, my thanks for your willingness to do this. Just in going around and hearing your perspectives and, and tracing some of those similar threads and yet having very diverse threads, having very different uh, perspectives and, and situations of upbringing and, and um, interactions has, I think, going to lead us to a, a very uh, meaty conversation and something that uh, will, be, will be very beneficial. I, um, I want to start us off by just asking a very, very wide open question. But before I do, let me try to carefully frame this. Um, I recognize that uh, in the reactive uh, fervor that a lot of white people are experiencing right now, uh, and, and whatever motivation people are coming to that with. I won't judge their motivations, but I know that one of the things that has been uh, warned, I have been warned about, and, 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 uh, and I'm careful to try to tread lightly here, is uh, 
presenting the idea that um, we as white people are demanding that black people tell us what needs to be done. And as if uh, the, the burden of solving the problems that we <laughs> have caused is somehow on you. And now we are coming to you in a condescending or, or in a uh, demanding tone even and saying, well, what, what would you have us do? And so I recognize that voice is out there. And I recognize that that voice is offensive. And, and I'm, I'm trying very carefully to not be that voice. So please uh, hear a better question than I will probably ask. And it comes from a, uh, a good heart with a good place. But I'm curious to hear you just talk for a minute about what is it that I, as a white Christian, don't know about your experience? What would you have me know? What, how can you help to enlighten me a little bit? I don't have an order. Uh, I, I'm opening this up just to, uh, to hear your responses and let you take it where you will. I'm deferring to the elder statesman here, uh, Brother Solomon. <laughs> uh, uh, well, okay, I'm the old guy. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Um, well, well, let me just say this, Jeff. Um, you know, to, we also approach this uh, with humility, knowing that we we don't know what you and our other white brethren do or don't know, right? Um, so some of it is based on assumptions. So, you know, for you personally and for other people who might hear this at another time, understand that if it's something you already know, then, then don't worry about it. Um, we, uh, we, uh, you know, I will, and I presume that, that, that our, our brothers will, um, respond in a way that, um, may presume that you may not be aware, but, but there are a number of things. And so, you know, I was trying to think through this because you talked about it early and I'll share a few things that we can unpack it and I don't want to take up too much time. And so I, I have a few things that, that sort of resonated in my mind. The, the first thing I think that, that, that needs to be understood it is a recognition that the Church of Christ, our, our white brethren in the Church of Christ, as a whole, really has a horrible history of racial discrimination within the church. Uh, it's pretty bad. And so um, we're starting from zero, below zero. Uh, and, and if many of you will recall, and I know there are exceptions, and there are individuals that, that are exceptions to that. But, but probably the, the, the marking point is that you know, most of our Church of Christ schools were the last to desegregate. Um, and, and so while the church should have been leading to inclusion, the church was really basically forced mm -hmm. to be inclusive. Uh, and, you know, that, that hurts. Uh, and that's a, that's a baggage, and it goes back to exactly what Dion said uh, about the experiences of the black preachers back in the day. I remember, and I was, I've told this story before, I remember being at Lipscomb and seeing an old broom closet that had the, the, I could see the letters, you know, they had taken them off, but the wood stain was different. And in the letters, I could see the letters colored men. Uh, and, that there, that, and, and it was just like an old utility closet. And that was the restroom uh, for, you know, basically African-Americans at the time. And that, that was like- Robert, can I interrupt you just to say this? My freshman year at Lipscomb University, uh -huh. one of my professors who became the most influential professor and still somebody I talk to today, yeah. took his class to that closet, to that, <laughs> and showed us. Now, that door had been replaced, and he had to tell that story, but he mm -hmm. was very upfront about our history, and he yeah. was very adamant that we, as a new upcoming group of freshmen, recognize uh, as, as best we could what yeah. that was like. And so I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want you to know that is continuing to be by some professors, uh, uh -huh. a story that is told because it is impactful and something we need to hear. I'll be quiet. Yes. I apologize. Please proceed. No, no. I appreciate you sharing that because now it, it confirms that I wasn't crazy. Uh, <laughs> that someone else saw it um, and, and recognized it. Uh, another thing, and, and, and I know this always gets into, you know, a sticky area. When 
our white brethren support those um, who are white supremacists and hold white supremacist ideologies, um, we are personally offended uh, and hurt because to us, the clear message is that our lives, black lives, do not matter to you. Now, I know that you know, we, can, we, can, we can get into some of the other details, but the message is, is that, that I'm going to support this person even though I know that their rhetoric is, is anti-Black, anti-immigrant, anti-people of color. Uh, and, the, 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 and if we're sitting side by side, you can say, oh, I love Jesus all you want, but, but you're telling me where I rank. Uh, uh, on this, uh, on the ladder of priorities, and and that clearly is not uh, supportive. Uh, and we'll unpack some of this. Uh, and I'm not going to go too long, brothers. <laughs> I also want uh, to make clear. I think that some of our brothers don't realize this. Understand that, and and I know that the people hate to get off. We shouldn't talk about politics, but I'm, I'm but I'm going to lay it out there. Right-wing conservative political ideologies are not synonymous with biblical principles. Uh, in fact, if you will study the Word of God, really the Word of God is, is, has some of the most pro-inclusive, uh, diversity, equity, and equality things that there are. Unfortunately, um, our brethren have reduced biblical principles to being um, um, pro-life or anti-abortion, anti-LGBT um, issues, uh, and you know, uh, pro-law and order, and and they seem to think that that is a Christian, right? Uh, and and it, and and there's there's we know that, and and I think that uh, as men of God, we do understand that that life begins before birth, and and we believe in the life of. Of, of the unborn. Um, but we also believe in the value of the life of the person living here. And I think it's important to understand that we see absolute hypocrisy when someone is so staunch that they will support a pro-life political candidate or a pro-life anyone and, and not say a single word about those who are oppressing black and brown people, those who are putting Mexican immigrants, children in cages. These same people who say they love life. But the message again to us is, I, what I really love is white life. I don't love black life. I don't love brown life. Because if it were true, then you would be just as upset and incensed by seeing the abuses that are happening to black and brown people every day, and particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is the last one and I'll, I'll defer to my brothers. Silence supports oppression. When you see those things, you say, ah, I'm staying out of it. We're Christians. We're not supposed to, to get into all this stuff that's going on in society. When, when, when we are silent, when our white brothers and sisters are silent about what's going on that's oppressing our brothers and sisters, uh, in the world who are brown and black and poor and immigrant, then what that means is that you're not being neutral. You're supporting those who are continuing to oppress and are maintaining um, the status of what's going on in the world. I, I do believe that what's going on today has highlighted that and, and I'm hopeful. Oh, I do have one more. <laughs> the, the last one is, is that, um, Patriotism, as we have decided to define it, uh, is not synonymous with Christianity. You know, I hear some people, Christian people, America first. That's not a godly or Christian principle, but by no means. So you, you can't support it by scripture, but yet you will find a lot of Christians who will, who will do that. We really ought to be looking for how we can help everyone, how we can to other individuals. And I realize that it's complex in our society, but we should. The, the Good Samaritan in itself is a perfect example of what it really means to look out for those. And, and I'll turn it over to my brothers and give them an opportunity. Yeah, not, not to suggest that we're going to go in 
the descending age order and I, I Robert isn't that much older than I am I'm sure but um <clears throat> first it, it, it seems you know I, I seem I feel completely inadequate following a, a brother like Robert Solomon you know he told you his credentials I, I, he left a lot off you know I think you, you served as a, a judge at one point right um, so here's a guy who was a judge you know lawyer um, and, and, and has a wealth of experience and knowledge to, to inform everything he just said. Um, the, the only things I, I would add is, and, I, and I, I speak about this a lot, and it's this idea of um, people sometimes tend to think that the Black experience is some monolithic experience. Like we, we, we all experience the same thing. Now, certainly, the three of us, if we sat around a table and talked about our, our upbringing, our, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of similarities, a lot of same stories, a lot of same things your mama did that my mama did. And, you know, some of the same recipes that we, we our, our families have never met. But I guarantee we share some of the same recipes. We use open pit barbecue sauce like like that. That's something that, that that's, you know, we, we harmonize. But 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 it's different. And, and so I, I appreciate the way you frame the question, Jeff, um, a, a, as if to say, that you know that if you ask us to quote you're coming to us to answer a question that is 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 way more complicated th th than it appears you know what do you want us to do i'm really like that's why are you putting that pressure on us but th this is maybe the first thing we need white people to know why is it that we are always putting the onus on the oppressed to come up with the solutions to get the oppressed out of oppression um, you know, uh, that, 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 that's unfair and, and, and that, that feeds into an unjust, uh, and, and, and systematic and, uh, unequal system that you will, you will put the blame on the oppressed. There is a horrific video going around that I, I'm pretty silent on Facebook, but I actually spoke out against this of, of a woman basically laying out George's George Floyd's arrest record in the past as if to suggest the reason he was choked to death is because he was a bad person um we're, we're always blaming the oppressed for their oppression um and and quite frankly I'm I'm tired of that and I'm I'm sick of of, of, of that um Robert I, I appreciate you bringing up that in our history as churches of Christ horrific so my preacher growing up was you know one of marshall keeble's boys now many older white christians know marshall keeble they revere him but but understand that marshall keeble's story is one that is elevated because a school like lipscomb said we will not admit black students and, and so marshall keeble then is is funded to start a school for black preachers in order to train them to be preachers not because he was interested, it, not just just interested in in, in uh, educating black preachers, but because they could not do that at a white at a white school. It's it's built into who we are a, as a church, and I would say bigger. It's built into our country. It's built into the DNA of who we are, all the way back to 1619 in Jamestown, racism mistreatment of uh, uh, brown and, and black men and women, it's built into the culture. Ask, go to, go to the Jamestown settlement today where they celebrate and make a lot of money with tourism and look at the indigenous populations that were wiped out, wiped out when folks started coming over here to the new world to, to set, great for them setting up a new world, but, but the black and brown people have always been victims of terror and injustice and this still goes goes on this isn't just some recent events this isn't just since the the advent of video cameras uh when, where, where they're able to record what's going this is built in, in in into who we are and and i need for my white brothers and sisters this is prob primarily going to be a, a church audience i need for my brothers and sisters to come near to us and to sit down with us and to see and to feel this experience rather than 
you know, trying to, to, to create some, oh, you know, just, just get over it, move on. We've, we've progressed, of course we've, we've made progress, but, but we are still stuck. And part of that is because this country as a whole has not fully repented for what it has done to black and brown people through the years. Um, it, it has not fully embraced how the culture of, of, of this, this country is, is built upon white supremacy. All men are created equal meant all white men are created equal. Um, and, and it's hard to think uh, that, that, that a, a lot of that ha, ha, has, has passed and it, and it's, it still has, has rumbling in, in what's going on today. And, and I need for my white brothers and sisters to stop for a moment playing these clips of, 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 of folks, uh, you know, blaming black folks for, for what's going on. It's, it's just not helpful. Well, I'm glad that uh, my two elder brothers went first. You know, the Bible teaches us to entreat the older men as fathers. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that they got to go first and I would come in last. <laughs> no, no, with, without, 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 uh, with, with, with in, all, in all seriousness, um, you know, one of the things that I believe uh, that that I that I would like for individuals to know because I've heard this on a large scale um, uh, from from many individuals uh, not not just within our context and when I mean context I'm talking about Church of Christ but in other contexts as well you know you'll hear men like uh, John MacArthur refer to social justice as socialism uh, you'll even hear individuals who have been tokenized um, uh, like Body Bakum who will, who will do who will repeat that same rhetoric. I mean, what ends up happening is, is that, you know, what I've seen and what I've researched is that in the culture of predominantly uh, Caucasian churches is that there has been this culture of systematic theology that um, although we are autonomous, we have the ability to uphold these rites and these rituals that identify us as then Christians, when in all actuality, it's not politically charged to teach the teachings of social justice and helping the oppressed. This is what I want us to understand. Um, number one, you know, when you look at Matthew chapter four, you know, people see this idea of Jesus being being brought to the multitudes to heal people. Uh, but when you look at that word, where it talks about the afflicted and those who were sick, and it says that they were oppressed, and some of them were oppressed by demons, you'll see uh, that that word, suneko, honestly, it, it just really also means that they were pressed together by illness, meaning that they were oppressed. And so our people, essentially, when you're pressed together by illness or oppression, what ends up happening is your theology changes from systematic to hope, right? So what you'll find, especially in the Black church, is this teaching of hope. Because what happens is, is that you have individuals that come to church who not only believe in Jesus and believe in God and believe in the body of Christ, but there's also a sense of oppression that has drawn us together, right? The black church essentially was the breeding ground. What I, what I also want to understand too is a breeding ground of many of our political leaders, right? Because that was the only safe place that we had. And I say safe place because we know historically that churches were bound. Ministers' um, homes, um, pastoral leaders' homes had crosses burnt in their yards, right? Um, you know, my, my, my ancestors, and I'm not talking about just my, you know, those who, which we learn in history. I'm talking about people in my bloodline have been lynched and things of that nature. And so these stories have now been passed down. I also talked to my grandmother, and she tells me, you know, the existence of evening worship, you know, as far as she's concerned, oftentimes came from a place uh, came from a place of the fact that there were many individuals, uh, white congregations, that would not allow blacks to worship with them. Now they could use the building, but they could only use it at five o'clock. And so, what I what I what I what I don't want what I don't want white people to take away from this is that we are holding you responsible to the sins of your father. But what I do want you to understand is that Jesus acknowledges the mistakes of the past in order to heal us to move forward. You know, when we look at what the Bible says 
in John chapter nine, where Jesus heals the blind man and his disciples asked, you know, was it the sins that his father committed while he was blind? And even when Jesus teaches them and says, no, what happens? They still excommunicate him. They still excommunicate him as it pertains to, I do have three children, brothers. So um, they still excommunicate him because the rites and rituals were not uh, were not kept, right? They said that he healed him on the Sabbath. They, they didn't care that he can now see. They just saw him as an oppressed individual and they wanted to keep him that way. So even when Jesus gave him eyes to see, they still held him to his past, right? And so, and so when we think about that, we got to look at this idea that there has to be some sort of change. Um, when you think about men like George Benson, right, who stood firmly for 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 uh, to 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 say that he didn't want to be integrated. It took the 1964 Civil Rights Bill for Harding to become an integrated institution, and we see at Lipscomb, uh, at Freed Hardeman, um, and and you know obviously Oklahoma Christian has, has has taken his name down. But there there are institutions at Harding that that still hold this man's name in high regard. Now, when we think about this idea, the one thing that I want is that I don't want you to, you know, feel victimized by the past, but acknowledge it. I acknowledge that it existed. You know, don't respond in a manner that says, well, you know, I I'm not like them. And I, and I understand that. And I know that you're not like them, but we still have to acknowledge it. And, and I believe that once we acknowledge it, what ends up happening is, is that then we can move forward. Um, one of the things that I told the congregation is that, you know, it's going to take some discipling. It's going to take some teaching. You know, we're going to have to be okay with having this conversation over and over and over again until we've been able to teach the masses. You know, when I was teaching um, in, in uh, middle school, one of the things that we learned in middle school teaching is differentiation, right? That everybody's in the same class, but I teach you according to your level of learning, right? So if, I have a, if I'm in an inclusive classroom and I have a child with special needs, I, I don't push them out of the classroom, but I format my lesson to where they leave learning the same things that everybody else in the class is learning. And although that, that may look different than the child that has the ability to be self-efficient and learn on his own, right? But they still leave feeling the same worth and value because guess what? Not only does the guy talk social studies, so not only does this kid understand, um, you know, the, the Fifth Amendment, uh, but also my special needs kid understands the Fifth Amendment and they have the ability to articulate that in their way. And so when we when we get to a place in which we can reach that and understand that we are all Christians and that we know that teaching social justice, what I want, what I, what I think gets missed is that we think that teaching these things is politically charged and it's not. These are the teachings of Jesus. When we look at, John, when we look at Matthew chapter five, right? In the Beatitudes, the, the people that he taught were the people that were oppressed. They, they were the individuals that were oppressed by society. And so, and so what Jesus says, he starts it out, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Right. And so these things are our essential spiritual landmarks that we can utilize to teach our brothers and sisters that Jesus stood for those who were afflicted and not just afflicted physically, but afflicted economically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. I, I would, can I just jump in just just a resource if, if you want to read on just the, the depths of of Jesus launching and preaching the good news from the context of the oppressed. Uh, Howard Thurman, um, Jesus and the Disinherited, a, a wonderful classic book that, that talks about, you know, Jesus and, and oppression and, and why the gospel makes sense when you look at it in light of that, of that context. And, and just to add to you, Vince, Luke chapter four, Jesus is in the you know tabernacle. He's about to like launch his ministry. He reads, he opens the Isaiah. The Holy Spirit has anointed me to do what? You know, give sight to the blind. You know, the lame walk, preach the good news to the poor. Like that's, that's social justice, you know, release the, the, the prisoners. Mark chapter one, verse 14, 15, Jesus began to preach 
the kingdom is here. It's, 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 it's now repent and believe the good news gospel. And, and then the stories that follow that is what Jesus healing people. Jesus work isn't just about going to heaven. That's important. That's really is important. But when Jesus says, when you pray, pray this father in heaven, hallowed be your, your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and so there are things that we, we need to do, do here. And, and, and part of what we're hearing in this, this collective cry by African Americans right now is they want to hear some good news. They want some good news here and, and now. And, and, and it's largely gone. It's fallen on deaf ears. It's fallen on deaf ears. I just wanted to add this it was interesting because I, I, I uh, was part of a presentation uh, at the end of last week and, and, and the presenter gave an example. He said that you know, if I come home from work and he had a wife and a young son, if, if I see that my wife and my son are sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor crying, that they're in pain, they're crying. And he asked the question, what would you think of me if after observing their pain, that I went to the living room, turned on the television, and started watching my favorite show. What would you think of me? Now, most of us think like, you know, are you tone deaf? You, you got an issue that needs your concern. Something's going on with, with your, your, your wife and your son. Why wouldn't you respond to that? Uh, and really, that, that's, how, that's how the Black community, particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ feel, that we are experiencing this pain and yet, um, many of our brothers and sisters are, you know, kind of looking, hmm, boy, that's awful. Okay, anyway, let me go about my day. Uh, and there's a free, and, 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 and I'll talk a little bit about privilege, but that's what privilege affords, an opportunity to go about your day because we can think that this doesn't impact me. Mm -hmm. I can argue that, that, that we're in this together. So uh, it really does impact us, uh, but I'll talk about that later. And really quick too, you know, there, there's a couple of, and, and I would recommend, you know, just, you know, a couple of books, um, mm -hmm. one with, written by a Church of Christ minister, uh, who I, I, I will be uh, uh, talking with, you know, pretty soon, uh, but his name, Dr. Amar Sahili, um, who was the preacher at the West Oakland Church of Christ. Uh, he wrote a book called Eerie Silence, and it talks about the race, it talks about race relations and injustices um, uh, from, 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 from society standpoint, you know, as well as the, the standpoint of Jesus. Um, and, and as well, another seminary professor that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, Dr. Warren Carter, you know, Matthew and the margins. And so he talks about, you know, just the theology from the book of Matthew as it pertains to marginalized people. Um, and, and so I, I, I believe that if, if, you're gonna, if you're going to teach it, there is a way to teach it um, that that exalts Jesus above it all, but does not turn a blind eye um, to what we've experienced over, you know, the past two weeks on a viral scale, but what has been happening for the last 400 years um, to Blacks in America. Those resources are particularly helpful, and, and I thank you for those, and, and I'll probably be uh, asking you for, for more as, as we continue down what is a long road still ahead. Um, I'm very interested, uh, uh, Robert, to hear a little bit more about uh, the privilege uh, aspect of that, and uh, if, if we could tap into that a little bit. I, I'd really enjoy, uh, I don't know if I'd enjoy it. I, I really need to hear that. And uh, uh, I know I'd benefit from it. So I think this would be a good time if you're of yeah. mind. Well, I think, I, think that, um, I, I think that it's important to understand this point and, and we'll launch into privilege a little bit. And, and that is understanding that um, racism is not only advanced through acts of violence and brutality. And, and the death of George Floyd is kind of the catalyst for a number of things. And that's what some people feel as though, okay, that's racism. That's the KKK, the, the hoods, the, you know, the, the using the N-word, uh, all those sorts of things, that, that's racism. And it is racism. But racism is also advanced uh, uh, through um, institutions. Uh, that promote inequalities in our society. It is advanced 
um, structural racism. And, and that's really complex because it's built on things that are set up in our society over time. Let me give you um, uh, an example of that. Um, the uh, Social Security, that's a pretty objective thing, right? That's put in place. Well, when Social Security was created, there were two areas that were exempted from Social Security, and that is domestic workers and farmers. And at the time that the Social Security Act came into place, you know who were primarily domestic workers and farmers? Black people. That, that's, so those people could not benefit from Social Security. Although one would argue, yeah, it's a great social program, right? Yes, it is. But in its structure, really omitted people. And so the reality is, is that, you know, today we have significant economic disparities between black people and white people. But we've had decades of this that's been built up over time, right? And so there are people who are white people today who say that I didn't do any of those things. No, you didn't. But you have benefited from the existence of it, right? Um, I mean, even if I look at my, 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 my own family and my grandfather, you know, he went to Tuskegee Institute, um, but he couldn't really find a job that was compatible with his education. He ended up working for a factory uh, and he moved from Alabama to Barberton, Ohio, right outside of Akron, worked for a, a factory, right? His inability to really capitalize on um, his education meant that economically he could not earn the same thing that his white counterpart earned. Right? And so his white counterpart then begins to gain some wealth and is able to pass on a little bit to his children. My grandfather doesn't have anything to pass on to his children. And now the next generation gets to pass on a little more to his children. And that generation, yeah, maybe they can pass on a little more, but you can see that the, the gap is widening. You know, an example of that is, um, you know, I went to law school, I graduated from law school, and let's say me and one of my white counterparts work at the same place making the same amount of money, right? But here's the difference. Because I'm a, I was a first generation college grad, my parents were unable to pay for my education, the significant student loan debt, I went into a con consumer debt simply because I had to pay for this myself, right? But my white count, so when I graduate and I'm paying my bills, I'm basically kind of digging out of a hole. My white counterpart who has the same degree, makes the same amount of money as me, but because of what happened through two generations ago, his parents were able to pay for the education. His parents were able to give him uh, a down payment on his home. His parents were able to purchase his car. And so now his money, same amount that I have, is being able to be used in a more strategic way. You know, maybe he can invest a little bit. Maybe he can get ahead a little bit further. So he's got a home. I've got to spend about five years digging out of a hole before I can buy a home. And so, you know, my, my point is, is that this is a structure in society that produces inequities. The same thing with the GI Bill, uh, something great for, for military officers, but with redlining, where black people couldn't buy in certain areas uh, and banks wouldn't write loans uh, in black areas, which means that those individuals were unable to gain wealth over a period of time and generations. Whereas the, the, the white middle class was built on the GI Bill, being able to buy that home, primary investment in property, It'd be, be able to get that equity. Okay, we're going to buy another home or I can take out a, a loan to pay for my kid's education. All those things happen. My, my point is, is that, that the white community does benefit from the existence of all the oppression that's happened over time, right? Um, but that doesn't mean you didn't work hard. That doesn't mean there aren't white people who have had to work, who've had pressures. That doesn't mean that, that they haven't experienced hardships. But, they, but, but you need to understand that it is harder, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's harder because you still have to deal with those inequities. You, there is still in our society, because of institutionalized racism, 
there are presumptions of qualification, intelligence, and all these things that our white community enjoys. So, so here's the point. You, we, we, there, because of white privilege, that doesn't mean you're supposed to feel bad, right? No, no one is saying you should feel guilty. And anyone who's teaching a guilt-based mentality has it all wrong. But there is a responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. To recognize that I benefited from these things. So I need to have a consciousness of what's going on in the world. So on the one hand, you know, I, did, I didn't create this system, but I can use my privilege mm -hmm. to combat the system, right? That's what we need to, to look for. The same one, you know, and, and we have privileges, you know, I have education privilege. Now I have some level of economic privilege. Um, I, I have male privilege because we still are a pretty sexist society, you know. Um, and so I need to be, I have ability privilege. I don't have any, any, any disabilities. So when, when I see someone who is being oppressed, I have a responsibility to speak for them, to help them, to reach out to them. And I'll tell this story and then I'll, and I'll move on and let someone else engage. In a number of years we discovered when I was at Ohio State, when I was in the law school, that our facilities people were shoveling the snow onto the handicap access ramps during the winter, right? Now, you know what that means? If I need an access ramp, I can't get into the building. Mm -hmm. it, it's bad enough that they were doing this, but I think the other bad part is that I didn't notice it. Um, it had to be brought to my attention by someone who had a disability. That's how privilege works. When you're privileged, it's like air. You don't see it, you don't notice it. And just like I did not notice that they were shoveling onto the access ramps because I didn't need the access ramps. I could mm -hmm. the steps. Not one time coming into the building did I have to think about how am I gonna get into this building? Not at all. And that's how privilege works. When we receive the privilege, we don't understand, we, we're not gonna recognize it right away, which is why having these kinds of conversations and discussions are so vitally important. So mm -hmm. that we gain a better awareness. And when we do get awareness, we have to be willing to speak up about it. We do need to, you know, when you drive by and see the police stopping uh, an African-American, I guarantee you that most white people that are, are, as I say, are more woke these days might wonder I wonder, is this a racial profiling incident? I wonder, is this person being stopped without reason? But with me, because I am a black man, my ire goes up right away. I'm, I'm wondering, was this person stopped for no reason? I hope that this, this is a good cop. I hope that, that, that this doesn't end in something fatal. And in some cases, you wonder, sh should I stay and watch to make sure this person is safe and OK? Whereas like, that, well, probably most white people think that, this guy probably did something wrong. Everything's okay. If he if he acts right, then nothing will go wrong. They might, and they might not even give it a second thought. But when when we see it, we see the potential of what could go wrong. And again, that's how privilege works. I don't want to. I don't want to. I feel like some may hear what you said and and be stuck with. Well, that was, you know, that was FDR and the New Deal. And that was, you know, that was the 1960s with redlining. There, mm -hmm. there are still things going on right yes. now as we speak. African-Americans on average pay more in insurance uh, premium mm -hmm. for no other reason except for we're, we're Black. Um, right. We are, we, in terms of like getting loans, we can go into the bank with, the same qualifications, credit score as a white counterpart, and more likely to be turned down um, mm -hmm. for, for no other reason <laughs> except for where um, I forget who mentioned it about the neighborhood. Of, uh, I think it was you, Vince. Says, yeah, yeah, in Linden. I mean, go and mm -hmm. drive into the Linden area and see how many payday loan places you see, and how many liquor stores, and how many places you can play lottery. Um, now those are the, the casino even. Mm -hmm. the, the casino was built on the west side mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a poor neighborhood. Why? Because poor people are the ones that's gonna gamble. Like there are systems in place 
that mm -hmm. take advantage of oppressed people. It's still going on. And mm -hmm. African Americans and minorities, uh, unfortunately, are at the brunt of, of still systemic things that's going on. And again, I mentioned payday loans, which is just one of the most ho horrific institutions of, of, of oppression. Um, mm -hmm. Please Google how much percentage that, that, that they charge. And again, it, it disproportionately impacts uh, minority communities. Um, and, 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 and folks of that, that have privilege have to speak up and be the voices that speak and, and see that and say, we, we have to stop allowing this because not only are they, do they exist, it's legal, mm -hmm. legal. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, there, I mean, we do a number of trainings uh, at CASE and one of them uh, trainings that I do is uh, interrupting bias in the hiring process. And so we're trying to train people about you know, recognizing this. And one of the things we point to is a study that was done on resumes submitted. And this has happened many times in, in housing and studies where they'll do resumes and they'll, they'll have the, the same qualifications, but they'll use people that have, you know, historically black sounding names versus white sounding names. And those with white sounding names will get twice as many interviews offered to them than those with black sounding names. Uh, people who are trying to check housing where there's apartments for rent and they'll, you know, someone, someone black will respond and the, the landlord will say, no, there are no vacancies. And they'll go right behind with someone who's white and they'll say, oh, yes, we do have a vacancy. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of things that, that, that continue to go on. Yeah, it's, it's still going on. And we, we can talk about a number of things. Uh, 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 and, and we really do need to be conscious of legislative agendas, right? And I know that, as I said, the, the people, we, we exist in society. Um, people talk about requirements about policemen living in the communities or living in the city limits or different things like that. Because what you have are people coming from outside policing the people who are inside. They have no relationships with them. They don't care about them. They don't value them. And it creates these consistent inequities that exist over time. Um, and I know that, you know, I do a whole presentation on privilege and there's no way we can cover it all right now, but, you know, hopefully that, that, that hopefully our saints will begin to understand that there are systems in place that produce inequities. And, and, and I'll say this, you don't have to spend time worried about um, whether there was ill intent or who was, who was a bad actor. And sometimes, People think that, well, you know, there, were, there was no ill intent for doing this and, and, you know, we shouldn't be worried about it or you're being paranoid. Well, I, and, and I appreciate Dr. John Powell, who is now a professor at Berkeley, he used to be at, at Ohio State and he's the director, I think, of the, the Haas Institute. He used to be the uh, executive director for the Kerwin Institute for the study of race and ethnicity in, in, um, at Ohio State. But one of the things that, that he talked about is what he, what he called were racialized structures. And, and what that means is, is that you look at the structure and you look at the outcomes, right? You look at the results. And if it's producing an equitable result, results, don't worry about intent, come back the results. If, if it's producing an equitable results, then we need to change it. We need to combat it. And, and, and we need to deal with it and, and start there and, and don't spend your time trying to argue that, well, it wasn't intended or there must be something that people are not doing right or they're not qualified or they're not capable or, or we're, we oppose affirmative action or whatever it is, but just look at the inequity. And if it's inequitable, then something's wrong and need to deal with it. If we deal with our children and, and, and you give them, you know, uh, you know, candy to distribute and, one kid never gets any candy when that happens. Another one gets about three pieces and one gets one. If, if that continues to happen, if your child comes to you and say, you know, dad, you gave us all candy, but you know, the so-and-so didn't give me any. You would say, that's not fair. Uh, and you would intervene and you would try to make sure that there was a, 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 an equal distribution of what was going on. Um, and, and we really do need to be engaged and active in those kinds of things. So. And, and, and really quickly too, you know, one of the things that, you know, I believe has to, you know, be brought to a halt um, is pointing to the exception. 
you know, um, I've seen that as it pertains to me and my brothers, um, you know, because, you know, we are men of color, right? Uh, my mother is a nurse practitioner. You know, my mother was also raised in the projects, but I also see the idea of if those who come before you do something and set that up within the confines of your home, you're more likely to do that, right? So, you know, I have my master's degree. All of my brothers have their master's degree. My brother Steven has his own nonprofit organization. But a lot of that was built on the backs of my mother and father actually having very decent jobs, right? We never had to worry about, you know, groceries or where we were going to live. I mean, we knew that there was an expectation that was set up there. Now, when you look at the other part of it, like what Brother Solomon talked about as far as, you know, digging yourself out of that hole, my parents had esteemed these positions, but they had no idea about really how, you know, the finances of, of, of college worked. Right. Because they were, you know, scholarship athletes, you know, things of that nature. And so, you know, moving forward, me and my brothers have had to dig ourselves out of that hole. But when you look at the next generation, right, you know, I'm, I'm trying to assume myself to be in this position to where my children have the ability to walk through college with no debt. You know what I mean? And, and start out at a place um, a, a little ahead. Right. But if I look at it from my counterparts, the people that I grew up with, they started in that position 15 years ago, right? So they're at least a generation ahead of, 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 of me, right? And their children will be ahead of my children, you know, so it just takes time. I mean, when we, we conceptualize the idea of time, you know, um, 1865, it's, it's really only about five to six generations. It's not a lot. And so there's still a lot of the structural, um, the, the things that have been put in place that affect even people who are my age. Uh, but, but again, you know, we really have to, you know, refrain from looking at the exceptions, right? Um, that people who transcend circumstance are not the spokesperson for all of us. Because oftentimes when we look at it from a place of privilege, we'll say, well, you know, your mom, she was raising the projects and look at her. Well, that's just one person. And if you look at the rest of my family who still lives in that impoverished area, you'll see that there are people who have the ability to rise through the cracks, but it's very, 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 very rare. So, you know, what Roxanne Gay says is that, you know, we must look at, look to how we can best support the least among us, right? Even Jesus talks about the least among these, Right, and not spend all of our time blindly revering and trying to mimic the greatest without demanding systemic change. That's that's rich. That's that's really powerful, and I I, I think there's so much there um, to really analyze and, and consider. I, I'm just uh, yeah, I, a couple of things that come to mind for me just that, that are are. are quick takeaways, and I can't wait to rewind this and watch it again. Um, but, but I think that uh, the difference between uh, guilt and responsibility, when you brought that up, I think that's a message that my white brothers and sisters need to hear uh, because they feel guilt. And so a lot of what they get is, I don't want to feel guilt, so I'm going to explain away or show how I'm not responsible. And it, it ends up defeating the entire purpose because there's no responsibility being taken. There's no acknowledgement of the reality. And, and Robert, as you talk about dealing with inequitable outcomes, we never get to that because we spend all of our time making sure I'm not blamed. I, I'm not responsible. And if, if I don't acknowledge it, and if I don't uh, acknowledge that it's even real, then I never get to the point of the inequitable outcomes that need to be addressed. And I think that is such a, a powerful and prominent um, message that is, is, is important for us to hear. Um, would you have any suggestions to me of presenting this? Uh, of how to how to help people understand that, um, and how to put it in terms that really provide a means by which well-intending people who have just been ignorant, for lack of a better word, uh, mm -hmm. can begin a process of change. Any mm -hmm. practical steps that you have, advice for me? Wow. Um, <laughs> 
and and and, I'll, I'll, and, and we can all jump. I, I think that, that some of it has started. I think that it's important to take it upon ourselves to, to read and to learn about other lived experiences, about other cultures and what other people are dealing with. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, the American way. I, it doesn't affect me. I don't have to learn about it. Know about it. But to assertively learn, I mean, you've been, you've been you know, immersed in it because you, you've adopted three African-American boys. So, I mean, you, you, I mean, there, and there are some people who adopt uh, uh, children of color who decide to basically uh, assimilate them to totally white culture. And, and I've seen a lot of them who may have some identity issues later in life. So it really is important to recognize that, that, that I want to understand more about this culture, recognize what, uh, in your case, you have children that are going to have these experiences and, and, and you need to know about how to deal with them. So, I mean, there, there, there's a necessity that will happen there, but you, but with all of us to learn about other cultures, to, to learn what it means, uh, to, to live in that skin. I mean, you, we can't experience it, but we can learn more. Part of that also in that learning where you're not calling someone else to teach you, but, but you get a foundation, right? And we talked about different books and we can, you know, the three of us certainly can share our resource list of, of things that are very helpful. Uh, but also to develop some meaningful relationships with people who are not like us, uh, to really humanize other individuals. And I, and I know it seems crazy to think that, that we wouldn't humanize other humans, but that is part of it. That how could, the, the, the greatest example, how could anyone see these, these Mexican children be put in cages and not be moved? And yet they're people, Christian people, who were unmoved by it. We got to have strong immigration laws and, you know, it's okay. And to rationalize it. But we really do have to humanize it. I mean, picture uh, uh, being in that spot. And I, <laughs> you know, empathy is really so important. Um, I saw a post today that I thought was incredibly powerful. And it was a picture of a white woman with her two boys. And she said, basically, these are my two white boys. These are my boys. And she said that if someone had their knee on their necks for 8.46 minutes, she said that if someone did that to my boys, she said, I would try to burn everything down too until I found justice. You know, and her point was is that don't, it, it's so horrific people want to turn away. And her point was, no, pay attention. Look at it and think about you'd feel if that was your child. And really what she was calling for is true empathy. And I think that because we don't have any relationships and all we really see are what's in the media or TV or, you know, or old wives tales that's been passed on for generations, sometimes we don't humanize one another. But if we humanize one another, we will have that compassion. I also think that it's important to to speak up and speak out. And I talked about that, having a responsibility. Um, we call that, you know, being an active bystander. Um, to say that I will not stand in the face of injustice and be silent. I will speak up, I will speak out. I don't know everything, I don't have all the knowledge and the information, but I will be a voice for what is right. And we have the word of God, which is the foundation for what is right and just. And we can stand. We can stand on the word of God for other things. We can stand on the word of God uh, when we see issues of injustice that go on. I mean, we we have that that power and that ability, um, and, you know. But you know, and I think that 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 we try to you know our own fellowship, right? Where we bring the the ministers together in Central Ohio, and I think that we've been doing this in a greater way than than ever in our history. Where we come together, and we just have lunch, and we talk, and we share ideas and suggestions, and 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 have you know, unified messages that we want to share. Um, we, got, we got to come together. And I think building those, those relationships can make all the difference in the world. And, and I, would, I do want to say this. A lot of times for those of us who have relationships, really close relationships with, with white brothers and sisters in Christ and even our friends. And, and I've had a number of people check on me and, you know, how are you doing emotionally? And I've, I've appreciated it so much. But we also want to be clear don't just feel compassion for me, but, but you should feel compassion for anyone, for anyone out there who's suffering. Um, 
And, and, and I think, and, and Dion, maybe you, you refer to it as those people who, and, and, we, and we see this happen every time. As soon as someone is killed by a cop, the, the, someone is ready to dig into their past and, and try to show why this person was a bad person or et cetera. They could be the worst person in the world, but they should not be executed in the street. That's, that, that's what our laws require. I don't really care what their past was. The reality is, is that no one, no human being should be treated that way. And then what we are left with is trying to show that, 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 that this person was, they really were a good person or they really were a nice person. And he had a mother and he had kids and he had a spouse and all this, which is relevant. But the reason why we, it, it's only relevant to the extent that we recognize that they are human. Uh, but but it, it could be the worst person in the world and it still would not justify that person being killed in the street. Uh, and we, and we shouldn't stand for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I completely, you know, completely agree. I, I believe that it starts with building the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and giving yourself an opportunity to have people that you can have a candid conversation with about anything, right? Um, we, we think about the Central Ohio lunch, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, we'll, we'll just just think about the the uh, the, the white brothers that, that attend, right? Um, and those men that attend, you know, I've either been in their pulpit or we've done some sort of ministry work together post having lunch together. And, and I believe that once we get to a place where we can build those genuine relationships, right? Um, because, you know, these conversations then, then are had, you know, from a place of, just friends, you know, um, and, and I, I think that that, that will align, um, you know, us together in a manner uh, that will be befitting because those kids are watching, our youth groups are watching, uh, you know, our children, our families are watching, and these things pave a way, right? We talk about privilege, you know what I mean? Like, would you have the ability to, you know, to, to show your privilege in a manner you put your children um, ahead of the game a little bit. You know, when you've shown that, hey, I can build a relationship with people uh, from all walks of life, you know, no matter the, the, the race, you know, the class, right? Because that's a big one too, um, you know, with exclusion and inclusion. And so, um, like I said, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and I believe that this is just the first step. You know, this is the first step to more conversations, more relationship building, um, and, and, and the ability to just grow. I mean, that's really all that it is, is growth. Um, you know, if we, if we, again, I refer to the Bible, you know, there were racial tensions amongst Jews and Gentiles, right? You know, Jews had this idea that I'll be more accepting of you if you get circumcised like me. Mm -hmm. right? those, those are physical limitations that they put on individuals so that so the acceptance would happen and what does paul do you know paul throws all that out of the window and and, and that's where we have to start but the relationship has to begin somewhere i was, I was going to say that uh, you know when you refer to the scriptures uh, because you always have those i mean an example is a, that that how uh, especially a lot of our white brothers and sisters have such a visceral reaction to black lives matter you know isn't that racist all lives matter all lives are important and you know, one of my examples that, that I use is, you know, when the Grecian widows were being neglected in Acts chapter six, you know, I said that was the first hashtag Grecian widows lives matter movement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, you know, you, you didn't see anyone talking about, but what about all the widows? All the widows lives matter. They, we should be, you know, interested in that. But, but, but what we see in a very practical way is that if there's a need, we learn from the word of God that we, we see to the need. That's all we're doing. We're seeing to the need. Um, but, but usually that kind of response is really uh, uh, an objection, uh, an underlying objection, and it really displays an underlying bias that people are unwilling to admit when you talk about those sorts of things. Um, because if, 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 if we could unpack it, the reality is, is that there's nothing wrong with us paying attention to a need. I mean, that, We've, seen, we've heard all the examples. You know, if one house is on fire and, and the firemen 
are trying to put out that fire and someone says, what about all the other houses? <laughs> you know, we think that's ridiculous. All the, no, none of the other houses are burning. Why are you talking about the other houses? Um, but the, the, the examples and the, analogy, the analogies are pervasive. Um, we have to really think about that. And I, I do think that the Bible, again, supports um, paying attention to the unique needs of what's going on. I know there's a hard stop coming up. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you, you asked a question, basically asking for some some practical, like what can we do? And and I, I and I'm just you know kind of summarizing. I, I don't know that a, a whole lot was just offered because I think the issue, Jeff, is is heart, man. It, it's like we could say here's 50 things you can do practically to get, but if, if the heart is not engaged in, in really, you know, participating in, and, and so the word that you heard thrown around over the past several minutes is, is empathy. And, and the only way to, to embody a, a heart gut-wrenching gut -wrenching empathy is to, to come near and to build relationships, to have relationships. Um, it, it's, you know, part of the anger I have, Jeff, is, that seemingly we have done so much in trying to explain the the the, the condition or or you know so, so you know so I've told my personal stories about being pulled over and having my rights violated and being pulled out and having my car searched and everything for no other reason except for me and another black friend of mine were driving a nice car in a white neighborhood. Um, I've, I've told the stories of, you know, being racially discriminated against. <clears throat> I've, I've told the stories of, 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 of applying for a church job. I got the job, but um, later on, I saw some of the responses and there were white members who says, we don't want him working here because he's married to a white woman. I've, I've, I've told those stories. We've shown videos. We have told other stories. We've, we've said, read the cross in the lynching tree, which is a book by James Cohn that that, oh my goodness, describe some of the horrific lynchings that have taken, we've done all of that and still people say, I don't think that systemic racism exists. So we can give you the list, but, but if your heart is not, and so it, it takes empathy, it takes coming, the biggest thing that we can do right now is folks, we need to come near. And, and right now you do need to sit in the pain of, of minorities, black and brown people, and hear what they're saying. Churches need to, white churches need to stop talking about race only when there are racial issues. Stop. I mean, if, when, when you do that, you're saying it only matters when we have a potential, you know, race war. Like all during the year, we ought to be talking about race and building these bridges um, and, 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 and having these conversations. So then when something big like this happens we're starting from a position of trust and relationship not distrust and and, and dissonance where we're just like talking past each other absolutely i, I saw i saw a quote I, I know our time is short uh and it really resonated with me um i saw it was posted online and uh, i believe the writer said you know if, if you can't conceptualize the idea of, of why there are picket signs that say Black Lives Matter and things of that nature, right? And, and even though that idea of mattering is just the first step, right? Because once I matter, then we have to move to a place of worth. We have to move to a place of, of love, right? Because I can matter, but how do we move past that as well, right? That's the big picture. But in the scheme of things, I like what the quote said, because the quote said, you know, imagine that one, that our wife walked up to us and said, hey, do you love me? And I said, well, I love everybody, right? That would mean <laughs> the sacrificial love that I'm supposed to have for this woman that I said I do to. And so when we, when we, that, that's essentially, you know, how, how it, how it feels. I mean, it's almost like if so, if I said, man, you know, I'm just really down because my father died and your response was, well, man, everybody's father dies. Right. So, you know, it, it would, it would demean what I'm feeling in that moment. And so you know, I wholeheartedly agree, you know, with what Dion says that it's a sense of a heart issue and it is a, 
a, a, a issue of empathy. And, and we know that even the prison and pastoral epistles of Paul, he talks about those things. I mean, even when we look at the book of Philemon, right? You know, he, he says, listen, you know, he left you as a slave, but when he comes back, I need you to entreat him as a brother. Yeah. And, and, and those, those tenets, like I said, can be taught. <laughs> they, 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 not, not can be taught, Brother Darby, but must be taught as it pertains to race relations in a proactive way. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and it's going to take time. It's yeah. going to take some building. It's going to take some series. Right. You know, we got some preachers on here. We know about preaching series. Yeah. yeah. You, can, you yeah. can preach it in a manner um, that 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 is palatable to all to all people, you know, because, you know, I, I can I can do a stewardship series and it can come off and rub people the wrong way. That has nothing to do with race. But I still have to teach it in a way in which, you know, you know, it's just like setting up a good meal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 want the service to be a one. You want the food to be a one. You you recognize the plating, right? Is the table clean? And 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 just know that this is going to be a process that is going to take some time. But we do have to be proactive, and we do have to allow empathy and love to exude from every fiber of our being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really believe that uh, the, what I'm, I'm taking away from this are, are, are some powerful principles. Um, and, and Dion, you said it well, you could give me 50 things to go and do, but it's about heart and heart uh, is, is shaped through relationship. Heart is, you said a phrase that, that we need to sit in your pain. And, and I, I I want to talk with you guys more uh, about how to further that. And, um, <laughs> and you're right, Vince, we got some preachers here. We can, we can, uh, we can do these things. Uh, and, and I think there's opportunities here for this to be just a, a first step towards an ongoing uh, series of steps as, as we help each other along in this journey. And, um, I, I look forward to what God will do. That's been my prayer. Since the day you agreed to, to come on and, and spend a few moments with me, I've just been praying, just, just help me to find the next step. God, just keep us moving on the next step. And this was the step that will lead to the next step and will lead to the next step. And, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate all of you and your time and, and your willingness, not only to come on here and do this, but to be a part of a healing process for our, our church family and to help us uh, to, to recognize where we've been at fault. Um, a great deal of conviction, a lot of confession is needed a lot of repentance is necessary and um and and we need to to lie before god broken and we need to lie before our brothers of color broken with an open acceptance of what we have been complicit in of what we've been silent through and uh, and how we need to do things differently and so um i said i think to dion to one of you on, on a phone call recently that uh, there's an old proverb that the best day to plant a tree was 40 years ago the mm -hmm. second best day to plant a tree is right now uh, we should have been here 400 years ago but we weren't but we want to be here now and, and we are grateful uh for your your love and, and your uh your forgiveness and your willingness to uh, to walk through this with us, and, and we're we're grateful, very grateful for that. I, I'm, I'm going to offer a prayer, um, and then um, I, I thank you guys so so much, and uh, and we will be speaking again soon with your permission. I, I'd like to continue this conversation because I think that um, there's much here for us to be blessed by. Let's let's pray, uh, Father in heaven. We just we come before you today as brothers, uh, brothers that have all been washed in the blood of your son, who have all known the mercy and grace of, of your love. And yet, God, we have not historically as people extended that grace and love and mercy to one another. And we stand in conviction of that. And we stand in confession of that. 
and we stand in repentance of that. And God, we need your healing. We need connection across racial lines, across class lines, across gender lines. We need you to step in and move heartily and, and breathe a, a new wind upon us. Change us and shape us. Help us to be your church. God, right now, we're not good examples to the world. The segregation that we have in our own brotherhood is not a good example to the world of unity that you call us to. And God, forgive us and help us as we proceed forward. God, I thank you for these three men and for their families and for the churches they serve. And I thank you for their willingness to, um, to love and forgive and to bear with and be patient. And I thank you, God, for the strength that they have. And I ask you for a double portion of that strength on them. And I thank you for the blessing that they are to me and to our church family. God, as we move forward, help us to do so with the clarity that comes from your light. And Lord, we just hold all this up knowing that you'll help us to take that next step. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Fellas, my deepest uh, appreciation. Thank you. God bless every one of you. Yes, sir. And, Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate you putting this together. Thanks, Can't wait. Can't wait to talk to you next. I, I look Thank forward you. to it. Thank you, brothers. Bye-bye.